so to jump right into it, and there we go. Uh, so to talk about bi-geometry, uh, I'm sure it's a term uh, that's new to, uh, to, to many of you here. So uh, when we look at bi-geometry, and this is not my remote, this is my remote. Uh, so we say that bi-geometry is a new field of science that uses specially designed shapes, colors, sound, motion, and wave configuration to induce harmony into biological subtle energy systems. So just to break this down, if we break it, um, by geometry, the word itself, bio means life, and then um, geo earth and metry measurement. So when we look at, uh, when we put the word together, we say the measurement of the life energy of the earth, including all life, uh, uh, including all life systems within it. So just because of um, time, I'm going to uh, not follow exactly the sequence of the slides and just explain a little bit uh, well, it's all in my own words, but uh, uh, condensing what you would be seeing in the next five or six slides. So if you look at the work of biogeometry, how it started is uh, my father, Dr. Uh, Dr. Brahim Karim, he's the founder of biogeometry, and he uh, graduated from Eteha in Zurich uh, with a PhD in a doctor of science in tourist planning. And Going on early in his career, uh, he was, uh, he had one of these serendipitous encounters where he was asked to renovate uh, one of the ancient Egyptian museums. And at that time was told about a body of work that uses uh, redesthesia uh, to measure the effect of different ancient Egyptian monuments on the body. And he was actually coming from an engineering background at the time, and, and he had heard a little bit about something like redesthesia while living in Europe, but it wasn't really kind of that scientific um, approach that he wanted, not that he was against it in any way. But he was told to go to France and ask, um, ask about what at that time was called French or physical redesthesia, and was more of a body of work that was buried and it had to do with, again, a big part of it was the effect of shapes on the body. But during, during experimenting with different shapes and research, uh, some of the researchers actually ended up harming themselves. So the work ended up getting buried and not, um, and not taking on or not following the same uh, path or growing the way it should have. So he went to France and he asked about these books. And, of course, when he first went into the store that, that he was recommended to go into, they said, we have no idea about these books. And then when I talk about the serendipitous event, there was one woman who heard him uh, speaking and she said, uh, are you the Egyptian? And he was like, yes, I am. And she said, where have you been? We've been waiting for you for three days. And all of this is for you. And she pulled out um, all of the French Redesthesia books and she said, this is for you. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is for an Egyptian to continue this research and bring it forth um, into its next steps. Now, if you look at this, uh, looking at what happened after this, so with French redesthesia, what it allowed it to do, and, and part of the reason that I would say, probably early on in this talk now, some of you are saying, well, is she going to talk about anything related to light and color? Um, so. Part of this research, actually what it did is it categorized every energy effect into a resonant color. So when I say every energy effect, Rasmus's talk was already a great introduction into talking about how we can talk about quantity versus quality. So we are so used to uh, looking at everything in a quantitative manner, but if you look at the actual effect of a color, there's an aspect of it that is qualitative. A lot of people have been talking about how colors make you feel. That is a qualitative effect. So in fact, also there's even been research when we looked at, um, or, well, this wasn't, uh, this wasn't independent research by geometry, but they looked at the different effects of, um, of waves, of electromagnetic waves, and they found that as they changed the shape of the wave, then the effect changed. So that is a qualitative change, not a quantitative change, because you actually had the same wave frequency. So the way that this redesthesia system worked is it divided everything up into its resonant vibrational uh, color. So this, this, if you go into history of healing from a vibrational perspective, 
this is how uh, we talk about first how you had ancient Egypt and in ancient Egypt you had uh, very much the understanding of what we call universal harmonics. So universal harmonics as well is looking at uh, when we, if you look at music today, we look at harmonics and we limit it to the sounds that we can hear. But in the concept of universal harmonics, we say, okay, so you can hear a certain amount of octaves, but does that mean that the higher and lower octaves do not exist? They do exist, they are there, and what universal harmonics asks us to do is to step back and look at music as an example of the manifestation of the laws of creation versus looking at it as the whole universe, which is what we do today. We limit sound to what we can hear, we limit colors to what we can see. So for example, if I was to say the concept, if I was to say the word an octave of a color, then that wouldn't really uh, make sense to most people if I talk about an octave of a color. But when we begin to see, and I'm gonna be taking you more through this, that there's actually a resonance between color and sound, uh, touch, taste, smell, all of our experiences, there's a resonance between them, they affect each other. It means that at one point, when we talk about resonance, there's a wave interaction, there's an exchange of information. That can only be true if there is somehow a communication between all of these sensory experiences. So for example, how um, in some restaurants now they've done experiments showing that they can play certain types of music to change the taste of food. Well, if we're doing that and that's a possibility, then what does it show you? That there's an interaction between sound and taste. But we're so used to now looking at it as vibrations that exist out there, and then our brain divides them up. So we look at this part of the brain does this, this part of the brain does that, this part of the brain does this, and then translates it all into something. But we need to understand that what we live within is a world where all of these are interconnected. And also I've heard some talks um, where people have mentioned the right brain and the left brain perception, and this is also a big part of this picture, where in the right brain perception, all of these uh, vibrations are actually part of the same, uh, if you want to think of it as a sea of vibration. And a good, um, a, a really good TED talk that I saw that showed this was, it was called a stroke of insight. And a stroke of insight was a neuroscientist who got a stroke and all of her perception went into right brain perception. Now, within this perception, what ended up happening is that she could no longer um, see, for example, the boundary between herself and the environment around her. She couldn't do some left brain tasks, such as looking and concentrating on specific numbers. But the main thing to get out of this talk is, if you look at it, your perception or our perception, not your, our perception as a civilization now is mostly within a left brain type of perception. But it doesn't mean that that right brain type of perception is not part of our reality. So in fact, we exist in both. And a big reason, um, also this was also, Rasmus spoke about this in his talk where he talked about the work of Pythagoras who also studied in ancient Egypt. And a lot of the work, the qualitative aspects of this work was buried and the reason for that is you came from a society or a civilization, when we look at ancient times, that is very much within a right brain perception. And then what ended up flourishing is when you had that right brain perception, what's new and interesting comes um, this left brain type of perception and work using numbers and words just for their left brain, um, their left brain part. So what I mean about this is using, for example, numbers just for mathematics but numbers have a qualitative aspect to them. So this became the part that we look at this shift from right brain perception to left brain perception. And what's interesting now is when we look as a society, we see that that bridge to right brain is slowly opening up. But it also comes, um, comes down to that when we look at different systems of healing, even from the past, even when it comes to color therapy, we have to look at them through the eyes of a right brain perception in order to understand them. So one way, uh, so this is like I was saying, so this is what um, we explain in a sense is imagine here that if you are able to take your musical instrument and go beyond the octaves that you hear, you would in essence get a scale 
that is from zero to infinity and be able to see what we say is step out of perceived reality into absolute reality. But let me just go back and say what is the importance of this or how do we do it? So I mentioned redesthesia and pendulums. And a lot of times, as soon as I mention a pendulum or redesthesia, people automatically step and think that there is, um, there is an aspect to it that is always has to be, am I auto-suggesting or it is not scientific. But here we move into understanding the work of French redesthesia. So there's two types of ways to use a pendulum. One is what we call dowsing, where you're asking a question connecting to the subconscious. This is not the work that we do. Instead, the work that we do is we look at what we call the monochord. And with the monochord, it's just a string that's stretched tight. And what happens when you pluck this string, you hear a note. So this is what we actually call uh, a quantity and a quality effect. So the quantity would be the wavelength, and the quality would be the note that you hear. But what does that tell you? It tells you that there is a resonance between a wavelength and a note. And when we look at this now, we see that that is actually how we use a pendulum. So the way that you use a pendulum, and it doesn't just have to be a weight on a string. Sometimes you have um, these, uh, it's like a, a, t a tablet type of thing with different wavelengths. But the way that we use it is that here, if I take the monochord and I put a weight in the middle, then that, um, and I cut it and I put a weight, that wavelength, half the wavelength, again, if we look at the laws of music and harmonics, half the wavelength gives us what? The same information, the same resonance as the full wavelength. So it would be a note that is an octave higher or lower whenever you go half or double the wavelength. So what this actually allows us to do is we start to begin to see this resonance between color, sound, smell, touch, taste, because for example, you can get the wavelength of a color and you could play a note and see that resonance between them. But there's, you don't have to limit yourself to studying with the pendulum. At the end of the day, when I say that there's a resonance between them, what does that actually mean to us? Is that they have the same information uh, in, in how they affect the body. So this becomes interesting, for example, for if you're working with colors. If I have a color and I am looking at this color, it's being delivered to me in the form of a sphere. Is that color going to be the same effect when I look at it in the form of a cube? And the answer is no. As you change the shape, it will actually change the effect of the color because you can't look at anything from all of our sensory experiences separately. If so, then we're always looking at one piece of the puzzle. This becomes very important because we have to look at as well, there's two sides to um, sound, color, like I said, shape, smell, touch, taste. And in one side of it, we're looking at it quantitatively. Everything is separate. In another side, when you are doing a type of healing, for example, what are you actually using? You're using what we would call the vibration of the color, the qualitative effect of the color. So you need to be aware that you can shape a color. You can shape a color to change its quality and it may begin to act like another color, so to say. So I'll go a little bit more so you understand where biogeometry comes in a bit more. Um, and, and just to go back, like I was talking about, so how in ancient Egypt we had universal harmonics and a study of uh, understanding the qualities of shape. After, um, after ancient Egypt, you had, as we go more into the left brain, you had a loss of what we call of this information of universal harmonics, and we began to look at everything quantitatively. That's when all vibrational healing practices moved from a law of the universal harmonics to what we would call the law of similarities. Law of similarities basically means from a vibrational healing perspective that if I give you two boxes of positive and negative polarity, you are able to place everything in this room into their resonant boxes. And what would you be trying to do? You would be trying to balance the body by if there's a problem in an organ and I'm seeing too much of this box, then what do I do to try to bring it into balance? I give it the opposite. If I change this from two boxes of polarities into seven colors, then what can you do? You can put each organ, for example, into its resonant color. And if an organ has too much 
red inside of it, I can bring it into balance by giving it a violet, the opposite polarity. But going into this now, so looking at this from an architect's perspective, when my father first inherited this body of work, where again, you could be looking at categorizing everything into different colors, categorizing everything into different polarities, there was one problem there, which is that he was not a physician. And he, um, not only was he not a physician, but he did not want to go into the work of going in and looking for uh, problems to give their opposite color, because like I said, he didn't have that background. And there's also so many different types of treatment methods that he didn't want to pick just one. So he looked at it really from an architect's perspective. And this was, um, this was a type of parallel thinking where looking at it now from a tourist planning perspective, which is where we said he had his background, he started looking at, if we look at ancient civilizations, we will find that there are certain spots, we call these power spots, that different um, civilizations have always gravitated to regardless of their beliefs. So if you look in history, for example, and you find a temple, then if you dig a little bit down, you could find a temple from an earlier generation on the same spot. And this is um, also, for example, a lot of our uh, religious buildings today, if you begin to look at the history, you'll actually find that these spots were seen as spiritual spots before the birth of the religion. So when we look at this now, we begin to see that there is actually what we call an energy quality that goes beyond belief, beyond, um, beyond religion and, and spirituality. I wouldn't say beyond religion and spirituality, but is common to all religions and spiritual beliefs, which is something that's uh, beautiful to see in this day and age where we like to see that everything is separate. But more importantly, is also we see that even animals would recognize this spot. So to give you an example of some of these locations, how they would be chosen in history, uh, one example, probably the, the easiest example, would be through observation. Okay, so remember we said that there was a right brain type of perception. Observation, looking at animals, looking at plants, looking at, if you think about it today, when you're picking a place to build your house, do you go out and look at how the trees are growing around this location? Probably not, but if you think about it logically, if you see a location and you see that everything is thriving, and, and growing in this location uh, positively versus another place where things are struggling to grow. Where would you want to live? So in the same way, for example, how they would choose some of these spots, one of the, uh, one of the monuments we have in Egypt, the Citadel, it was chosen by, they would take uh, meat and hang it up in different places all over Egypt, and they would see how fast the meat takes to rot. And where the meat stayed the freshest longest was the location that was chosen for the citadel. Um, I was just in, in Zurich now, and uh, the, one of the most famous uh, churches there, the Grossmünster, it was said that the location was chosen because Charles the Great was chasing a stag across Europe, and the stag came to this location, and it sat down, and it stopped running. So he, of course, had them not kill the stag, and they built a church there. Uh, same thing, for example, when I say it was a, an energy quality that we see by animals, uh, I was also, and if you look, you'll find so many of these examples. I was in Scotland teaching for a class, and we went to a castle there, and we went down to the dungeon, and they had this tree with a fence around it. And there was a story that how this location was built is that there was a donkey cart. The, uh, the man had a dream, and there was a donkey cart that was filled with gold, and he was told to walk around, uh, to, to let the donkey roam around, and where the donkey sits is where he would build the castle. And gold has a very special quality as well. Um, so that also makes sense when we look at it in this way. But now to go back and looking at the importance of a, of a power spot, is that he realized that this is one location. These power spots are also known for healing all around the world. Again, many different power spots, many different religions, but there is always some kind of healing experience. And there was already a research from the work that he inherited showing that sometimes they would look at the different energy qualities, or if you want to even say energy colors, of people who were more, who practiced more um, spiritual rituals throughout their lives, and they would look at how this changes them. So there was already this, this maybe this idea out there that even uh, spiritual 
uh, practices and sacred rituals would change or benefit our energy system or produce healing. But he asked this question of what if there's also something about the locations? And there's also a lot of times if you, uh, again, if you look in, in a lot of ancient texts, but a lot of this information is lost, there's many rituals are associated with a place. So if you ever go and you visit a sacred power spot in a new country, you might have your own rituals coming from your own spiritual beliefs. But really, if, if you're open to it, try to do the same rituals that, that the locals are doing because they have a way of interacting with this power spot. So if they enter from a specific door, then try to enter from that door. I was just in Asia in a temple, and I went straight through the front door, and they said, well, most of the people enter from the east and they leave from the west. So I said, okay, let me step back. And of course, there's a significance there as well with that beginning and ending energy related to the sunrise and sunset east-west. So again, going back to uh, sacred power spots. So at that point, my father realized that there is an energy quality or a location that can benefit people, can benefit humanity, regardless of the personal physical issue that they have. So what does that mean? It means that if you have, for example, uh, let's say you have a liver that is underactive or overactive and you go to a therapist, it doesn't make any sense that they would ever prescribe you the same thing. You have different problems. But can that person benefit from going to sit in a power spot and begin to get their body in what we call a more centered state? Yes. So this was the only energy quality that he could think of that didn't have a dosage effect, meaning I could expose you to it as much as I want, and I don't have to worry about pushing you into one side or the other. So this is where we come in and we see the difference between balancing versus centering, where we say that in balancing, what you're trying to do is that you're actually trying to, if you look here and we think of the circle as the archetypal perfect balanced energy system, and then we begin to have physical stress, physical interactions that push that shape in and out. And what do we do in a balancing system is that we go in and we try to squeeze everything back in. Now, of course, we all know when you try to squeeze from one side, then something comes out the other. So centering is actually trying to go back. And instead of trying to squeeze it all back in, we go to the original archetype, the original energy, that power spot centering energy, and try to surround that body with it. So just to go back here now, um, there's just one more part that I want to cover from this slide, where, of course, as an architect, after years of research, um, my father found, if you want to think of it as the energy code for how you can detect the energy of a power spot, it's actually its resonance with three different qualities color qualities that you always find together. So it's what we call a, go uh, a higher harmonic of a gold quality, ultraviolet, and then a color that we call negative green, which is in the grayish range. And you will always find these occurring together in a power spot. But now, of course, when he found this, he wanted to look at the effect of shapes. Where do I find this in a shape? So the really amazing thing is that he found it in the center of all shapes. So if, for example, you're talking about chakras, and there wasn't a chakra system in biogeometry, it wasn't something that uh, existed because um, it, it wasn't something that was, again, the whole system was developed from the ground up versus taking, uh, taking information that was already there and trying to fit it in. But then he found that when you study the shape of the body, you actually find these energy centers, these power spot energies, exactly where the chakras are. So now the chakras took on a different meaning where they become the centers of the shape of the body. So what's very interesting now is that when we look at a circle and you're looking for this energy quality, you actually always find it in the center of a circle. So what ends up happening, and, and maybe this is, this is here for me to demonstrate for you. So if I'm looking here at a circle, and we're looking for this energy quality, you would find it at the center of a circle. But the center of a circle is not actually something that exists in our physical reality. Meaning, if I tell you where is the center of the circle, and you go in and you say, right there, I can always expand that center. And then where is the center of the circle? It goes into the center of the center. So this gave us already an indication that you have a multidimensional energy quality that has a communication property. So, this begins to show you 
how we begin to view all of these different energy effects or vibrations that basically produce our reality, our different sensory experiences. If we start here, we're used to seeing all of these things as separate, sound, color, smell, touch, taste. But when you begin to look, you actually see that they can affect each other. If they can affect each other, then it means at one point there is a resonance between them. So instead of looking at them as different vibrations out there in our world that come in and and then your brain translates all of these different nerve reactions into smell, touch, taste, we begin to see that outside that you are, that they exist together. So let me give you uh, an example here. So if we look at chromesthesia, if you look at chromesthesia, what is it? It's basically a type of synesthesia which heard sounds automatically evoke an experience of color. So this is, imagine now that the vibration out there gets crosswired in your head then you begin to experience one as the other. This is, I, it's, time is limiting for me to explain the significance of this uh, as much as I need to, but the whole idea is when we talk about redesthesia or using your body's vibrational system to assess a situation, uh, most people prefer to use electronic instruments. And we do in our work always use biofeedback and neurofeedback devices. You can prove this very easily because like I said, when I say that a color and a sound can have the same information on the body, I can hook up the body to a biofeedback device to see this or a neurofeedback device to see this. But we really try to use what we call an objective qualitative scale with the pendulum. We're trying to develop this uh, because your body, if you're always relying on an instrument, then you are always at the mercy of the sensitivity of the instrument. And your body, just like we talked about, for example, are there sounds that exist that we can't hear but do affect us? Yes. So just because we can't experience them, if they affect us, we need to be aware of them. As a vibrational body, the, one of the big problems we have in trying to create a vibrational science is that your body is in resonance with the 100%. And if we only look at all of these vibrations as their existence within our perceived reality, then you're trying to balance the 100% through the 1%, which is not possible because you're affected by the 100%. So for example, take ultrasound as an example. We use it, you can't hear it. So to even look at now more of this concept between colors and shapes, for example. If you take white light and it goes through a prism, what happens as it refracts into different angles, you get different qualities. So here you begin to see a resonance between angles and colors. If we look at the work of cymatics, what is the work of cymatics? It's um, looking at if you take different, you take sand on a vibrating plate, and then as you play different sounds, you see these beautiful images created. Now what's even more interesting is if you change the shape of the plate, then the shape created by the sound also changes. So there is a resonance between shape and sound. So one, um, I'm gonna quickly show you some of the research that we've done or some of the applications that we've done with biogeometry. And one of the biggest applications that we got to do was actually a regional harmonization of um, two towns in Switzerland. One's called Hamburg and the other called Hirschberg. And when I say a regional harmonization, so what happened was there was um, a cell tower that was installed in the town of Hamburg. And people started experiencing a lot of different ill health effects. Some people had to start living underground. And uh, my father, having studied in Eteha, um, had a friend who knew of his work and the local government contacted him and in collaboration with Swisscom they, uh, they did a harmonization. They applied it to the town of Hamburg and later on the town of Hirschberg. Uh, I'll show you a quick clip. I won't play the whole thing because it's a little bit long but I just want to show you the goal of what we're saying now of how you can work. So you might say how can you how can you come in and change the effect of electromagnetic radiation without actually changing the frequency. Well, that goes back to that example that I gave you, where they found that if you change the shape of the wave, 
um, then you would actually get a different effect on the body. So you can, if you think about things, if you've heard of proportions or angles, such as the golden ratio, for example, well, you can apply that to the shape of a wave. If you work with light and it has dimmer settings, then you should be aware that, first of all, that man-made electromagnetic radiation and the human body's electromagnetic radiation are not the same qualitatively. So the natural electromagnetic radiation is not the same as when you recreate it um, with electricity. But if you have, for example, something like a dimmer, what does a dimmer allow you to do? It allows you to change the shape of the wave of the light. And you'll find, if you try this with your clients, that if you change that dimmer setting, if you make it brighter, then you will be getting a different effect. Why? Because you're gonna be changing the shape of the wave. So we actually went on the towers in Switzerland and applied actual shapes to each of the towers. And there was a qualitative scale that was used to assess, a quality of life scale assessed, to use to assess the residents before and after. So to give you an example here, you can see the amount of people. So everything at the end was translated into the number of complaints. This is before. And do you see, uh, this is, sorry, uh, this is, yeah, this is before. Do you see the number of free complaints versus the number of free complaints after? And this continued for two years after. Now, the idea here, the reason that I'm showing you this graph is because we didn't go in, they were tested from everything, from nervousness to sleeping disorders to even uh, the biggest complaint that actually came from electromagnetic radiation. At the time, you have to remember that in the town of Hamburg, they wanted to remove the tower. And what they came and they said is they said, even if you take care of our physical symptoms, we are not going to, we don't want the tower there because our symptoms are not just physical. The biggest thing we're experiencing is actually mental and psychological. The, one of the biggest complaints that they got was with the installation of the cell tower, uh, people were saying that they no longer have a will to live. Now, this was a big aspect where I know, you know, from this, even from a, from a personal side, uh, this was, it wasn't the first time that biogeometry had a national exposure. In, in Egypt, uh, we were part of a national hepatitis C study where um, in, the, in, the first in the first trial phase, uh, biogeometry was at 90% in restoring liver enzymes compared to interferon at the time, which was only 20 to 30%. But this was the first time where it was not just physical, it was psychological in the sense that, you know, I, I remember my mother having a conversation with my father at the time saying, it becomes very, very subjective. But of course, uh, we knew that at the end of the day, you can't separate your physical and your mental well-being. So we said, okay, you know what, let's put that in the study and, and see what happens. So this is actually the before and after on the psychological level. Do you see free and then free? So what we're saying is that as a society, if we begin to look at all of these different vibrational um, vibrational factors that make up our physical reality, again, color, sound, smell, touch, taste, shape, then you can actually move from this to this. Because we do believe that if you check any society today, you're more likely to see a society today that is like this versus a society that is like this. Of course, we haven't gone and done this, but it's a general idea. Something on the antenna, every single antenna. That also answers a question that we get a lot where some people come and say, so why can't you do this for every single cell tower? Well, we had access to the antenna. We have access to the towers, those two towers from Swisscom. So th this is just another interesting thing to see where in Egypt, my dad gave a TED talk and he called it, why is the cow smiling? And it was because he said, if it wasn't for the cows in Switzerland, then all of this work in biogeometry would have just come down to a placebo effect. So there's, there was this news press conference and, and you know somebody came out and said it was a placebo effect and um, one of the residents came and she said, sir, our cows do not speak Arabic. And, and then you can see here that a lot of the news um, said that Egyptian ensures calm in the barn. Uh, and then you can see here, well, it's too small for me to see, but you can see also it talks about how the cows are having less miscarriages and a lot of restoration in terms of the ecology. For example, the first thing that happened was with the installation of the cell towers, um, they were no longer getting bats. And one of the first thing that they were so excited about was when the bats came back. So 
what I'm gonna do is, if it's okay, I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play the video at 12:20. That way, that way, anybody who's going off into lunch uh, can go off, and anybody who wants to see the video, it's five minutes. Uh, you're more than welcome to. It's also on our website or YouTube page. There's just one aspect of electromagnetic radiation. I'm just going to discuss quickly, which is the fact that electromagnetic radiation, when we talk about it and cell towers, very few people talk about it in the sense that it is actually a compression wave phenomena. And if you look at electrosmog, we almost always use this term now to say something like there's a lot of electromagnetic pollution. There's a lot of cell towers here. So I say there's a lot of electrosmog. But if we look at um, electrosmog, we see that there is actually a compression wave effect that happens from the movement of electromagnetic waves in our environment. So to, to put it very simply, is that if you think of here an electromagnetic field moving in the environment, we don't live in a vacuum. And as that electromagnetic field moves, um, it creates, it, just like the boat here, creating ripples of uh, creating ripples in water, well, the electromagnetic field does the same thing. It has its own effects in the environment. So the, if you want to see the physics behind this, a good reference or the best reference is probably Dr. Constantine Mayle. And he explains that when you have electromagnetic radiation and it's moving through the environment, you can also get a scalar wave effect. The main thing that I, I just want to highlight here is that you have the electromagnetic wave and then you have a compression wave effect, which is non-electromagnetic in nature, and it can move wider distance, in a wider distance than the electromagnetic wave. So again, here it says the electrosmog is the layman's term for the proliferation of electromagnetic radiation in the environment. However, the resulting stress is not only due to electromagnetic waves, but also to the resulting longitudinal waves that cover large areas of the environment. This is the actual definition of electrosmog, which is different from electromagnetic radiation because it is non-electromagnetic in nature and cannot be detected using mainstream electronic devices. So think of it as the electromagnetic wave. Of course, you're gonna be affected if you're a person here and you're within the field of the wave, but just because you, you've no, you're no longer in the actual field or you can't pick it up with a meter doesn't mean that you're safe. So this is why, for example, when we did the work in, in uh, um, Hirschberg, the people didn't feel better until we actually had to address um, sources of radiation that were far away, that you were not picking up with the meter, but what was picking it up? The body. So I'm going to just skip through some of, this, uh, some of these studies. I'll show you one. This is also with Wi-Fi and looking at anxiety. It was part of a thesis looking at... Um, um, mice exposed to Wi-Fi and the anxiety, the different uh, measures of anxiety and uh, locomotor activity. And then they had also a cage designed with biogeometry principles and it showed that uh, within the cage that was designed with the correct proportions and angles, they were no longer experiencing these effects. So for example, uh, here you can see um, the results of the experiment indicated that the rate of the mouse's ability to swim to save itself after treatment in the geometric shape and the random shape of the normal rate again. So basically, if you look here, we see that what this is is that it's a swim test, and then they use this for depression and seeing um, how much the, the, the mouse will swim. So if you look here, if we look at the control without the Wi-Fi, Duration of Im immobility, 39.56. With the router, 103.56. And then with the shape. So the shape is that this test was done with a biogeometry shape. There was a, uh, here you had your control, control exposed to Wi-Fi, an existing biogeometry shape, and a biogeometry designed house. And you could see the different results. So again, different things here that were tested. Um, in terms of how often they would go to the bathroom. Uh, so here, how often they would groom themselves. This is another um, study which had to do with the effect of Wi-Fi on uh, melatonin. And so um, I'll just read to you the conclusion. So the use of biogeometry shapes along with the exposure could cope the hazards of EMF. This was evidenced by increasing melatonin and decreasing HSP-70 levels, as well as the restoring of brain oxida oxidative antioxidant homeostasis. 
Conclusively, the, exp the investigation shed light on the possible protective role of biogeometrical shapes against detrimental effects of Wi-Fi radiation on rat brain. I'll just skip to one more study quickly, because there's a few here. So this was, um, this is another study in the sense of, uh, when this study was done, it was measuring the effect of a space on depression. And this is important because it's, it's important, I think, for everybody also here who's working with light to see, is that this was a design student who came in for a thesis. Uh, she was doing her thesis in biogeometry. My father is a professor of architecture, so a lot of times in Egypt, he is able to come in and be a supervising uh, professor. He's never the main one because he doesn't want, he doesn't want to influence a student's thesis if it's in biogeometry. But in this one, it was a student who was using biogeometry shapes to design a space that would be relaxing and be, uh, be used for getting over addiction and getting over depression. So she applied all of these different design principles and that was her thesis. Now, coming into this, uh, that was supposed to be the end of her thesis. But when she brought it to my father, uh, he said, you know, this isn't enough. And for him, you know, it, it would have been enough in terms of what it means for, for biogeometry in the sense that she was saying, this is a, a positive space because I use the principles found in biogeometry. But he said, this is not enough. You need to go in and you need to find a way to measure this. So she contacted the medical department and said, I would like to test the effect of my space on, um, you know, on depression, on, on, on addiction, on different things like this of my design. Now, of course, they told her, no way. <laughs> You know, it's, we're not going to take patients off medication. You're a design student. This isn't a medical study. And then my father called, uh, again, he's a professor, so he, he called a few people. And, you know, their first reaction was always, stop sending us your design students. And he told them, you know, I, I will stop sending them when they stop getting results. But this is important because I think, uh, you know, we saw a lot of different talks here. And, and already in the morning, Abhai was talking about, um, uh, light and its cultural aspects, and then, uh, you know, and right before me as well, light for different healing with, with children. And, and you know, that's also, by the way, something that we're working on, is we're working on uh, the last thing that we did was design classroom shapes for children with autism, and we're working on testing these, so we built the test classroom shape, and, and uh, children with, as in collaboration with the Autistic Society are coming in and doing their class sessions there. One of the interesting things that we found is that uh, 90 degree angles will put stress on an autistic child's brain. So will the shape of a sphere. So if you think about that now, think of the environments that we always place children in, in order to do these, um, in order to give them their lessons. And, and part of the research also that we're seeing, which is really great, is having kids in the correctly designed classroom doesn't just affect the session, but parents have already reported that for 24 hours after leaving the classroom, a shape, because now it's just a shape built in our office, that the children are calmer and more relaxed. And so we're seeing that even exposure to this balanced or centered environment for one hour is having a long lasting effect. But to go back to this, so here, um, you know, he, he, told the, he told the medical department, I'm not going to stop sending you students until, they, until you show me that they're not getting any results. If people aren't getting any results, then okay, you have a premise for saying that a house design shouldn't be tested in the medical department. In the same way, should the lighting of our homes also be tested by the medical department? We always, when I say tested by the medical department, people automatically will think that I mean that they're not harmful. I don't mean that we should test them that they're not harmful. I'm saying we should test them to see how they can be used as a form of preventative medicine in all of our homes. And this was the idea here is that, this, these were her results by the way, so they did allow her, they set it up for her to test with mice. And it was um, control and then depressed with the biosignature. And then the biosignature is the biogeometry shape and two different types of drugs and a drug combination. Now, the idea here is that, um, yes, the, the bios I mean, you see that the biosignature is scored um, almost always better than the drugs. It's on par with one of them. They did end up putting the design on the outside of the cage that they were testing. So we do think it would have been better if it was on the inside of the cage, but it proved the point anyways, where yes, designing of our environments can be a form of preventative medicine. And I think this should be something that we're all pushing for, especially when you're dealing with lighting uh, and color. And it doesn't have to be abstract. It can be a type of, when, when we talk about, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a quick, very quick example. 
for some of you, if we had more time, I could give it and show it to you and demonstrate it, but for some of you, it'll make sense. For others, um, you know, it, it won't be the perfect example. But when I talk about having a qualitative scale of color, there is a level where I can look at a color. So if I take here this blue pen, there's a level where I can look at this blue pen and we could almost all agree that it is a blue pen. Maybe we won't agree on the shade of blue, but when you look at it, um, when you look at it, it will affect you, okay? Because what's happening for you to say that this is a blue pen, is it affecting your brain? Yes. Now, if I ask all of you, is this your favorite color or how would you experience it? When we look at the way that we experience a vibration, we go from a qualitative scale where this is a blue vibration and then our brain translates and goes into the meaning level. The meaning level is where this blue might evoke different experiences for all of you. And then we go and we project our perceived reality. But what if, for example, I was to take this blue pen and put it on top of your head? If I put it on top of your head, now those of you who work with different uh, vibrational um, science approaches will know that if I put this blue pen on top of your head, it's still affecting you. It's still affecting you because if you touch something, you're in resonance with it. Remember we said that there's all of your sensory experiences affect how you view this reality. But what is actually touching you? So if you look at it, if I can't see it, what am I doing? I'm limiting you from going into the meaning level. So it shows that, that there's actually a level where this is a blue pen vibration for all of us beyond going into the meaning level. That's the scale we try to use. Uh, that's what we use in trying to develop a color quality scale. So um, with that, like I said, I'll, I'll play the, the video. This was just another article that was uh, showing Biogeometry Designs. And the editor, it was the editor of Veranda Magazine said he's going to write the article and he knows what to call it. And he's going to call it Calm. Because he said when he first visited this apartment, it was in New York. And he said it was the first time that he ever saw, um, that he ever saw his cameraman calm. So I know I'm completely over time, but I will play this video for five minutes uh, just for you to see. And then, um, and then that'll be, that'll be it unless somebody has any questions. Okay. So it's in German, but I hope you'll be able to read. Hemberg, Idyll ist gelegen im Kanton St. Gallen, alles wäre in der Ordnung, wenn im Kirchenturm nicht eine Swisscom-Antenne stiegte. Die reibt seit anderthalb Jahren die Nerven auf. Zwei Dutzend Anwohner klagen über Kopfweh und Schwindel, Schlafstörungen und Müdigkeit. Die Antenne sei die Schuld. Im Sommer ist die Linderung gekommen. Ein ägyptischer Architekt hat im Kirchenturm Holz- und Plastikformen montiert, sogenannte biogeometrische Figuren. Und bei den Anwohnern sind Beschwerden prompt verschwunden. Ein Wunder, Schiss oder Einbildung, der Bericht von der Evelyn Falk. Er sei ein Scharlatan, der ihn verzaubert, verhext oder sogar hypnotisiert. Vorurteile sind gross gewesen, denkst genauso. Heute tönt es anders. Der Ägypter Ibrahim Karim hat überzeugt. Ich habe heute, meine ich, eine wichtige Botschaft an Sie, nämlich Danke zu sagen. Ich möchte mich ganz herzlich im Namen des gesamten Gemeinderates bei Ihnen, Herr Dr. Karim, bedanken für die Arbeit, die Sie geleistet haben. Der Ibrahim Karim, der ägyptische Architekt, der der ETH Zürich studiert und doktoriert hat, in der Kirche Zemberg. Den Medien zeigt er, wann er an der Nattelantine von der Swisscom gemacht hat. In der katholischen Kirche, im Turm, ist die umstrittene Sendeantenne. Der Ibrahim Karim hat an den Sendekasten und an die Leitungen Figuren montiert, sogenannte biogeometrische Formen. Da in dem Fall sind es kleine Plastikblättli. Biogeometrie ist eine Designsprache von Formen, Farben, äh, Klang, das in der Umgebung eine harmonisierende Energiequalität gibt, die gleich ist wie in allen Sakralorten. Das Komplex, das Ganze simpel gesagt, durch die biogeometrischen Formen wird die negative Energie in eine positive umgewandelt. Kommt zu glauben, dass das funktionieren soll, aber die Wirkung ist unbestritten. Genützt hat es beispielsweise bei der Rosemarie Keller. Noch bis vor kurzem hat sie massive Beschwerden gehabt wegen der neuen Sendeantennen im Kirchturm. In ihrem Wintergarten beispielsweise hat sie gar nicht mehr sein. 
Es war ein Rauschen im Kopf bis zur Unerträglichkeit, dass sie raus mussten. Sie haben es nicht mehr als zehn Minuten mögen verleiden da rein. Überhaupt nicht. So fest reagiert? Ja. Und dann hast du hast nicht können lesen, hast gar nichts können machen da draußen. Und äh, was dazu kommt, dass auch die Pflanzen seither reingegangen sind. Ich hatte schöne Pflanzen da drin, die habe ich nicht mehr. Die haben es auch nicht vertreibt. Mit einem Messgerät haben sie und ihrem Mann geschaut, wo im Haus die Strahlenbelastung am wenigsten stark war. Und das war besonders unten, im Keller. Da unten hatte sie kein Ohrensausen mehr, kein Kopf, kein Schwindel und kein Herz. Mit der Zeit war sie nur noch hier unten. Seit drei Monaten geniesst sie wieder ihren Wintergarten, seit Ibrahim Karim bei ihr daheim biogeometrische Formen installiert hat. Figuren aus Plexiglas oder aus Holz, Kleber an den Scheiben in allen Ecken. Seither ist es der Rosmarie Keller wieder wohl. Es gibt einfach verschiedene Materialien, die er offenbar nimmt. Aber es ist ja die Figur, es ist ja die Form, die es macht. Hokus Pokus? Nein! Nein, Gottes Willen nicht. Nein, es ist kein Hokus Pokus. Wir haben das erlebt. Es ist genial, aber ich weiß nicht, wie es funktioniert im Grunde genommen. Ich weiss es nicht. Andere wiederum im Dorf, die über keine Beschwerden geklagt haben, sagen heute, seit im Kirchturm die biogeometrischen Formen sind, gehen sie ihnen einfach besser, sie schlafen besser oder das Rheuma hat aufgehört. Der St. Galler Kantonsarzt hat keine medizinische Erklärung gegeben für das Phänomen und trotzdem ist er überzeugt, die Leute bilden sich das nicht ein. Ich bin froh, dass es geholfen hat, aber ich weiß ebenso wenig, warum das, das hilft, wie warum die Leute zum Teil ihre Beschwerden haben. Also müsste man das im grossen Stil überall machen? Warum nicht? Ja? Alles, was hilft, ist gut. Also in dieser verflixten Situation, wo wir so wenig wissen, eigentlich, ist alles, was hilft, gut. Keine Beschwerde mehr, dank der Biogeometrie. Ein fertiger Kabis, sagt der Präsident der Interessengemeinschaft Smog Betroffene. Er behauptet, die Swisscom hat die zehnte Leistung vor Antennen abgeschraubt. Darum haben die Leute keine Beschwerde mehr. Die Swisscom Scheisse bewusst. Swisscom sagt, also nicht nur Swisscom, das sagen alle Mobilfunkbetreiber, sagen klipp und klar, alles ist die Einbildung. Und wenn man die Einbildung will, beweisen will, dass das nur Einbildung ist, dann muss man mit der Sendeleistung halt nachhelfen. Dann muss man die manipulieren, um das zu beweisen, dass das so ist. Wir haben nicht umgeschrieben und wir haben auch nie eine Leistungsüberschreitung gehabt. Das können Sie beweisen? Das können wir belegen, ja. In Hemberg sind sechs Familien begleitet worden, die wegen der neuen swisscom antenne gelitten haben. Heute sind alle beschwerdefrei. Genau sagen, warum und wie das, das überhaupt wirkt, kann niemand. Und trotzdem, Swisscom glaubt daran. Es gibt noch viele Leute, die sagen, sie sind elektrosensibel, was ich durchaus auch nachvollziehen kann, dass es einige Empfindlichkeiten gibt. Und äh, es gibt sicher auch noch Gegenden, wo sie sagen, wir haben etwas Ähnliches wie in Hemberg. Schauen das an. Und dann machen sie es. Selbstverständlich. Wir, wir sind offen jetzt für diesen Versuch. Wir sind auch offen für weitere Versuche. Gibt es tatsächlich einen weiteren Versuch, wird der wissenschaftlich begleitet. Das hat Glaubwürdigkeit auch die von Ibrahim Karim. Er selber fliegt am Samstag wieder zurück nach Ägypten. Das Hemberg ist das Projekt abgeschlossen. Überall sind die biogeometrischen Formen platziert. Jetzt hoffen sie oben einzig, dass die auch in Zukunft wirken. Und der Ibrahim Karim hat bis jetzt nicht verlangt für das Projekt. Wie viel das es in Zukunft kostet, weiss man noch nicht. So viel für heute. Was Schweiz aktuell ist, sehen Sie morgen wieder am 7. Uhr auf SF1. Einen schönen Abend. Bis gleich. Thank you.